proverb, I am because we are, is the foundation of the ACBN YouTube channel. Tap in for all of our remarkable content and ecosystem mobilization through the phenomenal practitioners and thought leaders we engage on this channel. In the words of Adrian Marie Brown, things are not getting worse, they are getting uncovered. We must hold each other tight to pull back the veil. Get ready for another amazing ACBN powered interview. Welcome, Foster. We greatly appreciate your leadership. So can you please introduce yourself to our viewers and listeners globally? Thank you very much, Sarah. It's nice to meet you and nice to be on this platform. Uh, my name is Foster Wintiti Akugri. I come from Ghana. I hail from the northern part of Upper East of Ghana, to be precise, uh, born and bred in the South, Greater Accra. I have not lost my roots. <laughs> I identify clearly and speak my local dialect um, within, uh, within the roots which I, I originate from, but I've had the privilege uh, to learn about the world through travel and the internet. And um, I currently serve as the head of innovation at Old Mutual Limited uh, as an insurance and life uh, it's a live insurance and pensions management firm in Ghana with its mother company seated uh, in South Africa, uh, the largest insurance uh, business in, in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, with an assets man uh, under management of about $290 billion and presence in about uh, 16 countries, um, as well as satellite offices in Asia, in Europe, in the United States and Australia. Okay. Um, prior to that, I, I was head of youth banking and the innovation center for Standard Bank Ghana, also a member of Standard Bank Group, the largest bank in Africa by assets, um, also, also South African. Um, I, some years, I think I'm about eight odd years ago, eight, nine odd years ago, I started the Hack Lab Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization that's focused on preparing the youth for future jobs. Okay. And uh, at the time, the conversation around the future of work had not started. Mm -hmm. And I was just somewhere mid year in my college years, um, trying to figure out how to find people who are as insane as I am, um, think differently, mm -hmm. think uniquely about right. solving problems and not being critiques of problems, but rather taking the initiative. And so I came together with a few college friends of mine. We started the Hackler Foundation. Mm -hmm. Eight years on, we've impacted over 17,000 people from across 12 countries. Uh, we've placed almost 2,000 people into jobs. Um, directly supported about six, 7,000 women. And we continue to go and do what we do best, which is leveraging hackathons as, mm -hmm. as an instrument to convene and on the back of convening these people, giving them access to technology tools, uh, resources to learn at their own pace. We use competitions to help them build their credentials and expose them to the job market and facilitate internships, job placements, scholarship opportunities for these young people to help turn around their lives. Uh, you realize that in this side of the world, Africa to be more precise, we live in a very, very political environment, mm -hmm. um, even, even in a traditional setting uh, where there's, there's an invisible line of social classes where you need to know someone or you need to belong to a certain group to be given privilege. Right. Privilege by extension being certain things that are your basic rights, including education and access to equal opportunities that government provides. But unfortunately, you always need a broad hand or a helping hand, an executive sponsor to mm -hmm. represent you. Yeah. For me, I came from a very, very, uh, a little below average family. Parents sacrificed a lot for us and got us to where we are today. And I, and I, and I see clearly the trend growing with people who are first of their generation or first of their family line to get into college, first of their family lines to win an award, yeah. first of their family line to win a competition, to be given an opportunity to work in a, in a multinational, to travel out of the country. And for me, 
those things go to sow deep seeds and roots into these families to break chains that limited them from thinking about the possibilities of being global or being part of a global community where they can be recognized. And I always say loosely that we, we represent the uncles and the aunties and the influence they never had in their families to help them break those chains and set the pace for the next generations within their families. So that's really what drives what we do. And that is who I am, Foster, driven by the purpose of helping people find their paths. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that amazing outline of, of your of your background. That's very helpful. So just putting on your, I guess, innovation startup hat, uh, when you think about AI in Black communities internationally, what is the potential and what are some of the perils? Um, Artificial intelligence still remains a very great area being studied extensively now with more for, more attention from the rest of the world as it has advanced and has moved from theory to practical. Um, and even practical has moved from more technocratic level to, to date to basic level where people interact with artificial intelligence every day today through chatbots, uh, through chat GPT, which is very popular today. Um, through devices that they, to, to, to access certain services provided by certain organizations. Mm -hmm. And so artificial intelligence has become a part of our day life, right? Um, it forms part of what we call the fourth industrial revolution, which was profoundly, uh, 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 profoundly defined by, by the Professor Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum several years ago, when he wrote the book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. And there were a lot of predictions that you see coming to pass today about artificial intelligence right. and what it could do. Um, as humans continue to evolve in technology advancements and finding ways of doing things faster and better, mm -hmm. um, we still expose ourselves to building a device that will mimic how human beings do things, but with accuracy at the core of it. Right. But the question remains, is it, Will it will it uh, will it defy will it devour will it devour the ethical values behind who we are as people and the principles underlining the foundations of communities? Mm -hmm. And what role do machines play in our lives today? And what role will human beings play in the community development? Um, mm -hmm. What will be preserved and remained for human beings, and what will be preserved? A world would be allowed for the machines to take over. And this paradox remains a debate globally as to whether it's AI today is ethical or unethical. And I'm sure along the lines of the conversation, we'll go extensively into, into some of these thematic areas. Right. So how have you seen entrepreneurs using AI to scale their businesses in sub-Saharan Africa? I'll use myself as an example, right? Um, I am a management consultant um, in the background, practicing for about seven years. And in my last, I started using ChatGPT in December 2022, when it was not yet public, because I belong to the open AI community, and I had the privilege of to test it, to test it. Mm -hmm. And between then and now, my outputs, compared to my outfits for the last six years of my practice has, has been enormously multiplied. Right. I mean, I can take on more tasks now with less human, uh, human uh, in, uh, with less uh, ex extra hands needed for research, for analysis, right. and, uh, and for, uh, and for uh, administrative tasks like putting together documents and all of that, referencing, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it has cut down my turnaround time to delivering for clients way faster and has increased my productivity in terms of mm -hmm. moving from idea to, to a proper implementation plan, as well as doing things like risk assessment and, and, and monitoring and evaluation as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even furthermore, there are entrepreneurs that are emerging out of this developing third party solutions that are feeding on the back of this infrastructure, this powerful infrastructure built by the open AI community. 
to create their own ventures out of it. So you see emerging generative AI companies developing solutions that are generating creatives like posters and flyers, just putting the instruction in the feed to creating animations and right. illustrations to simplify how things are done and giving people more time because now I have more time to do other things. I don't feel burnt out again mm -hmm. uh, as I used to just working on one project. Right? Right. It also allows me to give the best to my, 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 my customers at the end of the day because then I have access to a world of knowledge, a world of libraries, the internet as a whole, to the brain of one single artificial intelligence mm -hmm. system. Right. So it is creating opportunity. It is increasing productivity. Um, right. It is giving us more time on our hand as entrepreneurs to focus on other things that really matter. We can now spend more time focusing on the people we work with and not be so immersed in the work we are doing. Right. So in terms of products or tools like chat, GTP, what does the future of work look like from your perspective and how will AI continue to impact the labor force? I think the future of work presents opportunity for everyone to start to really chase what they dream of becoming mm -hmm. since they now have more time for themselves. One, right. two. It gives, the, it gives every single person an equal opportunity to become a professional in any field. Mm -hmm. or a service provider in any field. Because now I don't have to go to school and study computer science for four years or seven years with a master's degree and now go and try to work for an organization before I learn how to write code. I can literally give instructions to the AI to build for me. Number two, it gives opportunities for everyone who dreams to own something but requires somebody else to build for them to rely on the AI to build for them. If mm -hmm. cost of building was the challenge or the barrier to entry, mm -hmm. there are so many entrepreneurs today who are not technical, do not have technical know-how, but have brilliant tech ideas they want to start, but do not know where to start from. Right. With, a, with an AI assistant like ChatGPT, it allows you to be able to have a conversation with this free version of it and in the future mm -hmm. maybe buy a premium version at eight, ten, twelve dollars to allows you to do more advanced uh, activities. So you realize that the barrier to entry for people would to entry for people who aspire to become entrepreneurs or build some fancy application that solves a problem for them will reduce significantly. What does that present? It presents an enormous opportunity for people everywhere in the world who has access to these tools and resources to mm -hmm. come up with novel technologies, novel ideas that they may never have seen the light of day without the support of an artificial intelligence right. system. Right. So I think the future of work is going to look like everybody would become a generalist. Um, mm -hmm. They have the ability to do everything on their own, but poses threats as well, which is if I am doing it myself, then what happens to the guy who would have provided this for me as a service? What happens to the guy who invested several years in building his expertise in these mm -hmm. areas? But I think what AI can never replace is experience and wisdom because um, it's one thing to have knowledge, it's another thing to apply the knowledge. And the AI is only limited in its function in terms of its consciousness and its awareness about its environment, about implications of its actions and choices, about what it decides to do uh, in terms of uh, based on the input it's, it is given and the output it, it gives to whoever it is is using it at any point in time. So we would definitely be exposed to criminal. The, the future of AI is also going to, the future of work is also going to, to with, with the advancement of AI is going to enable criminals as well who consider mm -hmm. what they do as work and necessity emerging out of unemployment and frustrations around the world. So I think there are two sides of the coin. There's mm -hmm. going to be positive benefits to this and there are negative benefits to, to this. And it yeah. brings me to the conversation around the ethics of artificial intelligence and the governance surrounding the future of work. What is permissible? What would be regulated? 
what will be deregulated, what will be, what will be allowed and what will be allowed, and how will this be monitored in real time to prevent mm -hmm. crime from increasing. Absolutely. So we're going to shift gears here. I'd like to hear more about Hack Lab Foundations. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you articulate the mission and vision of Hack Lab Foundation? So the Hack Lab Foundation was built on the principle of of, of helping young people find their paths, so right? Advancing technology across the global south. And our goal is to make sure that every single person, irrespective of their race, social class, and background, has equal access to education, quality education. So what we do at the Hack Lab Foundation has simply been to be a knowledge broker between the corporate organizations who invest in building these platforms uh, to make accessible their technology to these young lads to build mm -hmm. their ideas on top of. Because if I learned, if I went to school today and I studied computer science mm -hmm. and I was taught ERPs, enterprise resource planning or processing tools, but I never had the chance to see what SAP looks like. Right. And SAP ERP looks like just because I cannot afford a subscription of an SAP ERP. Mm -hmm. What do I do to build the necessary industry experience? I either have to go for an internship, which is also limited in, in slots compared to the number of students actively in school. Right. And so there's always a goose chase. There's always the survival of the fittest. The Charles Darwin's theory always plays every single time there's resource struggle between people for the same opportunity. What Hack Lab does is to create an abundance of these resources to people wherever they are by making sure we connect with the right organizations, okay. listen to the pain points of our young community members and say, okay, we see an emerging group of people who are enthusiastic about artificial intelligence. And so this year we are going to focus on this thematic area. The world in two or three years is going to demand blockchain experts. And so let's post a blockchain hackathon now. Let's start to talk about blockchain. Let's partner with organizations who are far advanced in building these solutions to educate our community members so that two years from now, they would have already acquired the knowledge, develop projects and build the necessary skill sets and be ready for industry. So I always say that the Hack Lab Foundation it's on a mission to leapfrog, you know, taking a step ahead of industry by preparing mm -hmm. the skills that will be required for the future, right. right? So we anticipate from research, we anticipate from sentiments, we anticipate from directions of global conversations and start to build and then start a conversation at the grassroots in the communities, in the universities, in the senior high schools, on the streets, um, through blue color, people who are already working and need to start to repurpose themselves to stay relevant in the organizations. We have communities that range from the ages of seven all the way to 40, 45. Wow. That allows people to pivot in their career if they're already advanced in their career, but also to instill that knowledge in them right from the onset. They say train a child the way he should grow and when he grows, he shall never depart from it. Or the early bird catches the early worm. So if you're a parent and you aspire your child to become a tech enthusiast, a tech novelist, uh, I'm sorry, a tech expert, mm -hmm. then that's where you start from. If mm -hmm. you've already broken out of, of you're already in your mid, in your in the picking in your career and you're not tech savvy, it's mm -hmm. never too late as a novelist to start to build your skills to become a professional. And we are always there to, to guide you. Right. And that's is a nutshell of the services we provide. Under the Hack Lab Foundation, we have different subsidiaries. There's Hack Lab Women, which is the dearest to my heart. Uh, second to that is Hack Lab Junior. Hack Lab mm -hmm. Women focuses on, 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 on um, a model we designed for the ODAC model, outreach dialogue okay. advocacy and community building. Mm -hmm. The reason why we set up Hack Lab Women two, two years ago was because for the last, the last five years prior to setting up Hack Lab Women, we struggled with closing our gender quota in every single project we were doing. Our success rate in terms of uh, gender participation, female participation in most of our programs was around, was covering around 18 to 25% most of the time. Okay. The only times we had 100% women participation in a project was because the whole project was designed for women. Mm -hmm. We went on to design 
uh, funds like travel grants for people to participate in our program. We define um, special award categories in most of our competitions and hackathons mm -hmm. just to reward women who participated in the program. Right. Uh, we designed programs that focus solely on women, but we realized that there, we needed to tackle the problem. We needed to break certain social uh, uh, foundations. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we needed to go back to understand who a woman is. What are the things that surround a woman? And what are the circumstances that surround a woman's decision and prioritization? Right. Right? If a woman is not healthy, a woman is, in, let's say a woman is in her period and okay. she doesn't have the right care, the right tools and resources. Right. It is a bigger priority to her than telling her about STEM. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. There's a class of women who come from families where women can never touch technology devices because it's mm -hmm. forbidden. It is um, a man's world. Mm -hmm. STEM is a man's world. Engineering is a man's world. Being mm -hmm. a doctor is a man's world. And so you need to break those social norms first before you can do anything. You can preach any gospel to them. Right. right. And so the outreach dialogue advocacy community building allows us to use the outreach vehicle to go out there and listen to women and what their real problems are. Okay. Right? The dialogue are forums that we set up to, to identify thematic areas that run across mm -hmm. women and be able to categorize and address their problems more specifically within those categories. Right. The, advocacy, the, the advocacy vehicle allows us to extract from the dialogue actionable plans that require advocacy, mm -hmm. education, lobbying, to get some of these barriers lifted for women. And the community is built to sustain the first three vehicles, right? right. To continuously recruit people into this community of like-minded women who share in problems, pain, and suffering, who share in identities of, of challenges they face, okay. who share in identities in terms of aspirations, and to connect them with other women Right. Who are already who have broken out of the ceiling to inspire them and become the blueprints they live their lives towards. Mm -hmm. right. So that's okay. really what Hack Lab Women does. Okay. It doesn't necessarily focus on STEM, even mm -hmm. just bias towards introducing women to STEM, but goes back to address these social cultural problems before introducing them to technology. And Hack Lab Junior focuses on kids between the ages of okay. seven to seventeen where we expose them to IoT, robotics, coding, basic coding programs. And then we put them into competitions, hackathons to challenge them. I believe that human beings thrive better or learn better or do better or get more innovative when you put them in a healthy competition. Hence Absolutely. why we use that as a tool at all levels of our mm -hmm. program design. So okay. that is really who our club is. Yeah. So how important is impact investing and philanthropic innovation to you and uh, to you and your work? There's only so much you can do as a nonprofit, to be honest, without external support. The mm. advantage you have is when you start small, you learn fast about what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You get to listen more clearly to the voices of the people you are trying to support and be able to develop clear challenge statements and connect the right impact investors to support you to scale. And so when you have gotten to the point where you have identified these clear challenge statements and built a community of people who believe in you, okay. you now have to have the resources to be able to move it, elevate it, to be able to meet your promise to them to say, we want to get to here because you gave us this information but we need the resources to get there. Right. And most of the time, it's difficult to really crack a sustainable financial model for a nonprofit organization. Right. So impact investing, that has that flexibility to help guide you transition from just giving to creating a loop of giving and receiving mm -hmm. to sustain the course. Because at that point, you prioritize impact, social impact, stakeholder interest before shareholder interest. Right. And you need investors who share the principles, who believe in your values, to be willing to bet on you, to be willing to bet on the stakeholders who are benefiting from the cost you're on. 
and eventually clearly help you demonstrate sustainability through revenue models, grants, um, um, some um, sorts of recurring revenue streams that come from program implementation, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, that is what will really lead you uh, through your philanthropic journey because it's not an easy right. task. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy task. So what, what is your ultimate goal with Hack Labs Foundation and what does success look for you look like uh, to you and your um, colleagues? Mm. So for me, um, by 2030, we launched uh, in 2021, we launched a strategy called the Decade of Action Strategy, which was okay. to lead us to our mission, uh, our goals in 20, 2030 say we would have impacted a million people. Um, we would have helped 400,000 women through, through our journey, and uh, which is about 40% of the quota minimum. Uh, if we do 60%, hallelujah, yeah. right? Um, success for us is when we have achieved the goal of the aspirational structures we want to put mm -hmm. in place, the institutions we want to build. We want to build uh, uh, an engineering school that is TVET focused, uh, right? You, where you do not have to go to the university for four years to learn how to right. become a UX UI designer, to be a graphic yes. designer, mm -hmm. to be a product manager. You learn hands on through another entity that we will develop called the Hack Lab Engineering Excellence Center, which is basically a business process outsourcing center. Mm -hmm. Companies or corporate organizations continue to downsize, and you have seen how there's been significant cuts in employees in most of the organizations, and rather outsource that to serve those services to BPO companies to provide these services for them. This, the, everyone who gets probably cut out of a professional job could potentially be a, a beneficiary of our engineering excellence center where we research, where we develop solutions and where we outsource the expert, our expertise to these organizations. Right. And then there's the Hack Lab Ventures, which is basically a, a venture capital, an impact investing venture capital that leverages the engineering service excellence center to help people who want to become tech entrepreneurs or, or okay. impact entrepreneurs to, to build their solutions for them through the engineering excellence center. So once you graduate out of our institution where you learn, the academic institution where you learn or the TV school mm -hmm. where you learn things around the future of work, mm -hmm. you get employed by our excellence center. You transition into the excellence center. Right. And if you do not want to work in the excellence center, you want to build, become your own businessman, then you transition into the venture program mm -hmm. where you get to build your own venture with the support of those two institutions. So wow. the future of Hack Lab, that is the future of Hack Lab. And the foundation will continue to go on its course, evangelizing, training, upskilling, bringing people to the point where they now qualify to get into the, uh, into the institution, the training institution to be trained and deployed into the industry. So that's right. really what Hack Lab's future looks like for us in terms of training. And we are all, our arms are open. We've designed these things for the last two years, mm -hmm. consistently preaching the gospel to organizations to help support us with, with, with the necessary resource and funding we need to finance this. At the end of the day, um, it boils down to having the, the necessary sponsorship to deliver. And we can only do so much on our own. So that is really what the future of Hack Lab looks like. Mm -hmm. So at one point you ran the Stanbit Bank Incubator. What actionable insights did you gain from SMEs there? It was, it was one of the most exciting projects I've worked on in my life. Um, this is the first innovation center or incubator mm -hmm. owned by a bank and a corporate institution in Ghana. Okay, wow. In 2018, I joined the bank in 2017. 2018, we launched the SB Incubator. Um, the purpose of the incubator was basically for the bank to create an, um, extend, an extension of the business to focus on the emerging SME market. And at the time, SMEs contributed almost 80% to GDP in Africa. Mm -hmm. So Standard Bank as a group decided to, to go on this mission of repositioning themselves to become an SME-friendly brand in the business. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And the SB incubator, which is spread across Africa, there's one in South Africa, there's some, one in Tanzania, Botswana, right. um, Mozambique, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, um, and the list goes on and on. And Ghana was number three on the list to have launched after South Africa and Mozambique. And okay. you had the chance to define the blueprints for many other standard bank countries mm-hmm. to follow. And for me, every single day there, every single minute, I always preach this, this gospel to my, my team members at the, at, the, at the SD incubator, that our purpose here is to lend that 30 seconds of ears to people, to, an ear to listen, a brain to pick, right? And then to be able to advise appropriately how they can move from where they are or connect them to the right people and resources. Mm-hmm. And through my journey there, we hosted over 300, 400 uh, workshops, training programs, impacted right. almost 17, 10,000 people, about 2,000 SMEs, um, almost three, 4,000 women were supported through the program. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we have a, a top class real estate co-working space located five minutes walk from the airport. And, right. and, right, and today it serves as a hub, a convening point for so many entrepreneurs who are looking for space to work, who are looking for space for their meetings, who are mm-hmm. looking to build their corporate governance. Because one of the things that has been brought to the market was to focus solely on corporate governance as a weakness of SMEs. Right. Because to build sustainable businesses, it's not about the ideas and the products. It's not even about the customers. It's about the systems and structures you put in place for the business to last beyond you as the founder. And that is really what our value proposition was focused on. And the bank in Ghana had employed almost 1,700 employees, out of which over 600, 700 of them were seniors, like they were seniors in industry, Right. with minimum of five, seven years of working experience. And these people served as mentors to the mm-hmm. entrepreneurs, right? So we had something called the Staff Mentor Volunteer Program. Because right. as part of your performance review, your performance KPIs as an employee, you had to volunteer time to social impacts, right? Mm-hmm. So there was something called SBE, Social, Economic, and Environmental right. Impact. And you needed to report on what you had done personally in your capacity to mm. impact community. So the incubator became that platform where most employees now met that, those quotas by contributing to volunteering their time and expertise to advise the businesses. And so right. it was easy for us to have over 48 disciplinary areas that we had expertise in around mm-hmm. business. So from marketing to legal, to accounting, to mergers and acquisitions, to fundraising, to operations, to procurement, logistics. And you know, the banks, banks are very structured and detailed mm-hmm. in their approach to operations. They never leave anything unturned. And so we transfer that knowledge, we transfer that culture, we transfer that mindset to the entrepreneurs through our program right. design. Right. So that was, that was five years of me at Stambic Bank um, mm-hmm. doing this. And it was very fulfilling. Uh, and I really appreciate them for giving me the chance to be part of that story. Absolutely. So do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action before we end the interview? Um, I am very grateful for this platform. I'm very excited. I, I see that for us to see change, we need to keep resounding in the minds 2,000 channels. If there are 1,001 people preaching this gospel, creating these channels, using yeah. these channels to reach a 10, 100, 1,000, a million people. We just need to keep dropping those little drops of change, 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 change into the ocean until the entire ocean becomes a change. And mm-hmm. that is when we will see real impact happening because it starts from the mind. And yeah. these conversations are basically to induce the mind to start to think different, to start to see different, to be inspired and to be motivated to wake up every single day and see opportunities where there are problems and not see just problems because they are problems Mm -hmm. and i would love to leave everyone who listens to this to 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 repurpose themselves to become change agents because to see change the change you seek starts from you in your community in your family 
to mm-hmm. the next person standing by you. And to you as a person, you have to learn to lead yourself first before you can lead right. yourself. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I will keep following your channel as well. Mm-hmm. My name is Foster. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, Foster mm-hmm. Wittete Akubri, uh, and I'm happy to keep the conversation going. Absolutely. We'll put we'll put the link and all your details in the description, but we just want to appreciate you for your time and remarkable leadership. And before we close, we want to close the same way that we began by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we're on and also acknowledging our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation, and we acknowledge the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you very much, Foster.